And the reason for this is the model predicts the filter angles that maximize the violation. One-dimensional spin will not do this. So I have here the two probabilities where I've ignored these terms. Let me look at these terms, A minus plus and plus minus. Remember, they were these complicated expressions, but they're not that complicated, really. High school students with trigonometry can work and use double angle formulas, and very quickly, you can find that one part, uh, A plus minus, which corresponds to the X representation, can be written in terms of the little vector A dotted into B plus C, and they depend upon the local hidden variables different for every spin. Or A minus plus, minus plus in the Z representation, corresponds to D, B minus C. These have to be orthogonal. They are orthogonal in there. I don't ask it to be. They are. So B and C are orthogonal. And in order for this to be maximized, A has to be collinear to B plus C. But because B plus C are unit vectors, the sum of them is root 2. That's the length, is root 2. So to maximize the correlation, A and B plus C must be collinear. And likewise, for the other component in the Z representation, D must be collinear to B minus C. And that then explains why the filter settings are chosen, which maximize Bell's inequalities. These actually turn out to be Bell's inequalities in Bell's original 1964 paper. And because B and C are orthogonal, these are zero. And you can easily see that if these are collinear, this can be maximum of 1. Root 2 is greater than 1. And so for each axis of quantization, Bell's inequalities are violated, which is good. It's consistent. As well as being able to predict the filter angles, I'm also able to have Bell's inequalities violated per axis. If I sum these two together, it's a little bit different than before, but it is the quantum mechanical result of the CHSH form of Bell's inequalities. And it's the sum of one axis plus the other. The CHSH form of Bell's inequalities derived the inequalities classically without taking into account non-commutation. And so sums up the two correlations effectively. But I'm saying here, oh yes, you do get the violation of Bell's inequalities of 2 root 2 because this is root 2, 1 plus 1. You get 2 root 2. It violates the Bell's inequalities, but you can only measure this axis or that axis at the same time. So the correlation found in the dimensional model is consistent with the correlations found in Bell's inequalities. And there's more evidence. As I mentioned, in 2006, I first came up with the idea of a two-dimensional spin. And in 2007, I went to a conference in Vaxlo, Sweden, where I met Carl Gustafsson. And Carl had been analyzing, he's a mathematician, he'd been analyzing the Bell's inequalities of CHSH form. And he said, when I told him about my root 2 spin, he said there's a root 2 spin that's in the CHSH form of Bell's inequalities without which you will not violate the inequalities. So those two vectors can be written, one as a unit vector, which is normalized, and the other one, the other one which is not normalized. And he extracted those vectors. And those vectors are completely consistent with the angles. I don't think it's worth going through them again, but you can see B, A and B plus C have to be collinear to make them one. And the two vectors here have to be collinear. And it again gives us the same filter angles and the values for those angles and the vector he finds of length root 2 has exactly the properties of my two-dimensional spin in isolation. The usual point particle spin does not do that. Well, I know that people who know this area will say, but you know, there's something wrong here. And there's something wrong is that Greg of Eyes and Elena Speck did one experiment, and they violate root 2. So what's wrong here? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because of the time, but Effectively, it's this. These are the expressions that one uses. Transmission, transmission, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus. This expression is the one that's used in the experiment. But that's fine when you have a single axis of quantization. But when you've got two axes of quantization, every EPR pair is capable of two coincidences. One that you can measure 
and one counterfactual that you can't measure. And so the total number of coincidences is twice the number that you actually observe. Now, you can never prove that because you can't count things that you don't measure. But you can imagine a Gedanken experiment whereby somehow we can overcome the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and we could measure, let's suppose, simultaneously the Z and the X component. In that case, you would see coincidences in the Z channel and coincidences simultaneously in the X channel. So, if you have one axis of quantization, no problem, and you get minus cosine theta in one shot. But if you have a two-dimensional spin model, you've got to do two experiments, and the total number of coincidences has to be taken into account, and that gives you, per experiment, minus one-half cosine theta, consistent with my model. So, that's what I'm proposing. It's something that you can really not say is right or wrong, because there's no experimental way, there's no objective way of proving it's right or wrong. But when you do this, you get this spin of zero angular momentum. You can represent it in two different ways in the Z and X component and get out half the correlation in one and half the correlation in the other. And notice that when you do measure it, again, that half the correlation is lost. And the sum of the two gives the complete violation of the CHS8 form of Bell's inequalities of 2 root 2 which is weirder, a spin with two axes of quantization or quantum weirdness itself. So, thank you very much.